Should Christians tithe? What is the tithe? It's 10%. We're going to talk about it. Uh, should we practice generosity? Should we uh, give joyfully? Should we give voluntarily? Should we give to those in need? The, you know, the tithe was simply, again, 10%. Levit Leviticus 27, 30 says, and he gives us a clear picture, every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It's holy to the Lord. You can walk through Scripture, particularly Old Testament, and see the word tithe. Now, this is very important. The tithe in the Old Testament was mandatory. Everybody say mandatory. mandatory. Say it again. They had to do it. They had to do it. So when we get in the New Testament in a minute, the, the, the whole thing shifted in my spirit. I, a whole new thing grabbed hold of me as I was as I'm walking through this. But I found in Genesis 14, Abraham offered tithe. Deuteronomy chapter 14 says, Be sure to set aside a tenth of all your fields produced each year. 2 Chronicles 31.5 talks about, this ain't on the overhead, I'm just throwing this out there for everybody. 2 Chronicles 31.5, as soon as the order went out, the Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, wine, olive, Oil, honey. This is what they had produced in the field. They brought a great amount. Of course, everybody knows about Malachi, the Italian prophet. Malachi. Malachi chapter 3 verse 8 says there are consequences for not tithing, but it's talking mainly about the Jewish nation. Amen. Everybody understand this? This is how the Jews did it in the beginning. So you walk through that and you realize the Old Testament is full of it. Now watch, the Jews were not commanded just to give 10%. They gave first 10% to take care of the service of the house of God. They gave 10% at a festival tithe, and they gave 10% to the poor tithe. In other words, they literally gave 20 to 30% of what they had to keep the nation going. Realize that is a greater tithe. Everybody understand that? I mean, it's even bigger. We tend to assume that in the Old Testament, the Israelites gave a total of just 10%. It wasn't true. It's 20 to 30. So it's important to remember that tithing was first and foremost an act of worship. Now, here's our problem. Everybody say mandatory. That word mandatory takes the joy out of giving. If it's mandatory, and I got to do, look, I have to give mandatory every year to the government. And anytime I've given my, when, when I get a, sometimes I've got a letter from the IRS that said I didn't give enough, Kenny. Oh, you're talking about painful. And I have to go into my coffers, I got to go into my savings, I got to go into the hidden places. And pull money out and give it to the government. And you know what? Not one time has it been joyful. Not one time have I been excited about it. Not one time has it blessed me to do it mandatory. So when I walk through the New Testament and I see in the, in the New Testament is tithing in the New Testament. We'll talk about it. Overall, the New Testament approaches the topic of giving much differently than the Old Testament. The Old Testament is much more black and white. It tells you what to give. Again, mandatory, when to give, where to give. The New Testament is a little more gray. Now, I understand gray because I kind of live in the gray. I know people that are black and white. I'm kind of gray. I'm like HD. Very gray. You know, I mean, uh, in other words, I see a lot of grace in life. When you're gray, there's grace. Can I get an amen? When you're black and white, there's law. A whole lot of law. But I'm, I'm very gray in a lot of places in my life. So, but, but not bad in a bad way. It wasn't bad in a bad way. Really, what the New Testament does is raise the bar... Given isn't a checkbox. It requires you to examine yourself and see, are you living in the light of what Jesus has done? So if I can look at it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it says it like this. But this I say, he who sows, gives sparingly, will also reap sparingly. In other words, you just give a little, you just give back a little. But he who sows bountifully, a lot, will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Everybody say, heart. Not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. There's nothing like when you give, it forces you to smile. It's hard not to smile when you're giving cheerfully. Now, if it's mandatory, and I've been in churches where pastors guilt people into giving, and they, and they feel guilty. I don't feel guilty if I don't give. I got, I got to give my tithe. I got to give my 10%. Look, I sent out this week a whole bunch of letters to everybody that gave. And I could say, well, look, this wasn't 10. You didn't give 10%. Or you, did, you didn't even get 3% to, that, to the church. I don't know what you. I could have done all of that like the Mormon church. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to back off and say, you know what? I want you to give generously. I want you to give cheerfully. And you can't do it if it's mandatory. Right? Okay, we're going to walk on through it. So we are to be generous. Why? Because God's been generous to us. We should be generous with our finances and with our time, amen, and our talents. And, and there's a reward. 
the scripture said there's a reward for our generosity. In other words, what we do here matters there. So the reality is the New Testament never tells us how much to give. Rather, it tells us to be generous. Each of us should evaluate our lives, ask ourselves, are we living and giving generously? Now, that's a big shift from the most stringent, mandatory, you've got to give 10%. Right? Right? For some of you think, I'm fixing to let you off the hook. I'm not. All right, I'm going to walk you through it. When you ask the question, should Christians, should believers tithe, it's really the wrong question. Followers of Jesus should simply be generous. Uh, it, it isn't tied to our salvation. If I don't give, amen, God still loves me. Can I get an amen? amen. But, but I know we like, again, black and white answers. I get it all the time. People try to pigeonhole me and force me into saying, you got to do it this way, you got to do it that way. First off, let me just tell you, to those who have been given much, they love much. So if you know you've been forgiven and you've had a past that was messed up and you know you should have been bound for hell, you know that you shouldn't be blessed, we live in the greatest nation in the greatest state of America. It don't get no better than Texas. I'm telling you, I've lived in Alabama. Amen. I've lived in other places. I've been to other places. This is a great state to be in. I love this place, man. We, we're so blessed here in the West. Everybody say West. We, we over here in the West, you, you ain't got no idea. When my daughter comes back from a mission trip, when I talk to other missionaries about Russia, when I talk to them about China, when I talk to them about Korea, amen, I find out a lot of places a lot worse than what we got going on here. On. Amen. Even, south of the, uh, even in South America, they didn't got what we got here. That's why everybody wants to come here. They love it here. Amen. So let me push you just a little bit. For most people here in America, giving generously will likely look like giving substantially more than they are currently giving. After all, Jesus has given us much, therefore we can give to others. So here I tell you this, give joyfully. Giving shouldn't be something that is forced on you or coerced. It should be something that is done with joy. It just comes out of you. Amen. Uh, give voluntarily. I, I love that scripture again. Let me go back to Corinthians 9 and just say it like this. He said, God loves a cheerful giver. I've often said people got cirrhosis of the giver. <laughs> Your giver is just hardened up and you won't give. Because you were skint maybe in other churches. You were forced. You were coerced. Amen. It was, you felt guilted into it. But you got to give out of a free will. Amen. Your heart's just got to be. So you give voluntarily. This builds off of the previous point. Part of giving joyfully means that we give just because that's what we feel like God wants us to do. So the focus should be on the heart, not on the guilt. It should be on our heart. So know this in the New Testament. Again, pastor, does the New Testament teach on tithing? The New Testament never resends and never revokes the tithe. I know some people think it does, but it never did. Watch what Jesus said. And first of all, let me just say this. I believe that Jesus tithed. I believe that he gave. I, I see, He even said you've got to give to Caesar what's Caesar. So if he said that, he's surely going to give back to the right places because this was his idea in the very beginning. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come to abolish. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will be by no means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. So Jesus mentions the practice of tithing in the parable to a Pharisee and a tax collector in Luke chapter 14. He affirms the Pharisee's practice of tithing even though he challenges the heart. Look here at Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you. When you see the woe in the Bible? That's worse than pulling on a horse's reins. It ain't like woe like that. But it is a woe like that. Pay attention. Woe to you. Listen. Teachers of the law of Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give tithe, you give 10% of your spices, your mint, your dill, and your cumin, but you have neglected the more weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. These are issues of the heart. Justice and mercy and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter, watch this, without neglecting the former. He said don't neglect the former. In other words, don't neglect tithing. But your heart was wrong, amen, and what you were given. So Jesus doesn't say tithing was wrong. As a matter of fact, let me tell you this. Jesus teaches and allows believers to give more than 10%. In Luke 19, Zacchaeus, remember Zacchaeus? We little man was he, climbed a sycamore tree, looked down, saw Jesus, asked Jesus to come eat with him. Who was Zacchaeus? He was IRS. He was a tax collector. He was a guy you hated. He was right next to FEMA. <laughs> so y'all think they came to help. They came to make money for themselves. Take your money. 
Amen. So here, here, here's Zacchaeus. He stood up after having dinner with Jesus, and he said, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. You know why he said that? Because he had been stealing from the poor, mandatory, taken from them. He said, I'll give 50%. Did you know Jesus never said to Zacchaeus, don't do it? He allowed Zacchaeus to go ahead and give 50%. Yeah, you go ahead, because that's going to, what's it going to do? Affect your heart. It's going to change your heart. Luke 14, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have, uh, you have cannot be my disciples. What's everything you got? Everything is everything. It's 100%. In other words, he says, 100% of what you've got belongs to me anyway. The air you breathe, the health you've got, the economy you've made, all that belongs to God to start with. So now we're talking about stewardship. Being good stewards. Matthew 19, 21, Jesus told the young man, Jesus answered, he said, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. There is a move on in, our, in America to be perfect physically. Oh, we make it up. We pull it back. We stretch it. We lipstick it. Amen. We do all these things to perfect ourselves. Jesus said, you want to be perfect? Give up everything you got. Come follow me. Again, that's 100%. So Jesus treats the tithe, watch this, as a great starting point. The tithe is training wheels. That's all it is. It's just training wheels. You know what training wheels are? They got them two little wheels on the side of the wheel. Amen. It's like a trike motorcycle, Kenny, something I hope I never have to ride. Amen. But it's got two wheels on the side, so when you pedal it, it keeps you from falling over. The tithe is simply the minimal because the heart has to be generous. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 So he treats, I'm a first-generation believer in my family who tithed out of obedience to honor God, who gave me life, gave me purpose, forgave my past, whether it was $10, $100, or $1,000, 10% was always a minimum in my life. I just look at it, it's always just been the starting place. It's where I start from. I know some of you are trying to reach it. I'm, I'm proud of you. Keep after it. But I'm going to tell you this. It's about generosity. It's about recognizing what you've got. I went back over my life. I couldn't hardly sleep last night because I've studied this all week long, Pastor Joseph. And as I was trying to go to bed, I'm thinking, I went back. I made for my first four years of ministry from 86 to 1990, my salary was $250 a week. Now, I know you say, well, Pastor, I was in the 80s. I don't know what you made in the 80s. But from 86 to 90, my salary was $250 a week as a, as a youth pastor. I never got a raise for four years. And yet, we built a large youth group. We challenged that community. I ended up in jail in 1990. When I got out of jail, I felt like God spoke to me and told me to travel. Can I tell you something? That $250 a week, I tithed off that. So God got 10% plus my offerings, plus what I did for the youth in it. And I was still blessed. I had a man show up and give me a motorcycle. Drug deal went bad. And he ended up with a motorcycle. And he said, I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I'm your huckleberry. <laughs> you know, that's how God was blessing me. And I would travel and preach. And I'd make more out preaching, two, three times more out preaching than I ever did being, being there. And I would make money doing that. And God started blessing me. But I never complained about what I got and what I didn't have. I even bought a house during that time. And then I traveled. After I got out of jail, I felt like God spoke to me. He said, go, start, start traveling. The, my pastor at that time looked at me. And he said, I want you to pastor this church. And he laid out the plans of a brand new church. You've seen it. It's right on Beltway 8 and I-10. It's called Family Church. Great big building there. I was asked to pastor that church. I said, I don't, I, I, that's, not, that's not what God called me to do. Let my brother-in-law pastor this church. As a matter of fact, he still pastors that church now. So I, I, I push people toward ministry while I travel. In traveling, you say, how are you going to make it? That's what he asked me. How are you going to make it? You know what I told him? I said, Pastor, I believe I can make more than $250 a week. You hear me? What I was doing was rebuking him. And I went out and started doing that. Adopted my daughter Mandy doing that. Did, I didn't have no money to adopt a, a baby. Hey, man, she's 11 months old. I didn't have no money for, for a bottle, a binky. Or, or, or anything to cover her bottom. I didn't have any of that stuff. But when God gave me that little girl, uh, we were able to take care of the lawyer, take care of stuff, and kept on traveling. And then I got another call by a little boy named Josiah. So I went up there to pick Josiah up and take the Air Force Base. I didn't have money to adopt a baby boy. 
Amen. You got to pay for the lawyers. You got to pay for the medical. You got to pay for all kind of stuff that goes down. But the issue was, do you want him? Yeah, I want him. So I took him and I had to trust God. Everybody say, trust God. Trust God. So I had to trust God. Guess what? The little boy slipped off his mama's arms, fell and cracked his skull from one ear to the other. Oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? Doug I had to go to the hospital down in, in, uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana. This happened down in, P uh, in uh, Abbeville, Louisiana. And it busted his head. I'm in the hospital praying over him. Big old watermelon-sized head. God touched my boy. Don't give him brain damage. Help take care of him. And God touched him, healed him, brought him back. And now I'm stuck with a whole lot of medical bills. I ain't even paid off the adoption. But I got medical bills. What you going to do? Trust God. Why? Because I've been generous. I've been a tither. Not only that, I've been giving over and above that with my heart. And next thing I know, that pastor, Pastor Wells, he sent out letters to everybody I'd preached for over the last three years. He said, listen, this just happened here. It was an accident. But, but Pastor Jerry's little boy fell and cracked his skull. Could you help him out? People started sending me. I was crying. They were sending us money to help take care of his medal. They sent us so much money that we paid off the hospital and paid off his adoption. You don't know what happens in life when God can sit. It can be look like a disaster, and God turn that thing around for your good. That's what he's done over and over in my life. Starting a church. When I started uh, my first church, we didn't have anything. Started up, he started in a building, seven people in, in a house, then a motel. Then God gave us the run of the motel. Then from the motel into an auction barn. And my, you know the story. Amen. It's been one thing on top, but it never stopped with this one thought that it, it, my giving never quit. I, I went from training wheels to being generous. And I watched that if God can get it to you, through you, he'll get it to you. Man came yesterday and gave me a pistol, a gun, big old gun, one of them black powder coat, coat 45, 50 caliber. Well, I don't know what it is. I could barely hold the thing up with, with one hand. And I looked at him just as honest as I could. And I said, sir, I'll take this gun, but you've got to allow me to give it to whoever I want to. And he said, you go ahead. I already got it in my head who I'm giving that gun to. This week when I do a funeral of a friend of mine, I'm going to give that gun to, a, to somebody else. You know what God did? He looked at me as conduit. If I can get it through you, I get it to you. Amen. And that guy was good with it. Be honest with people when they give you stuff. I may not keep it. I may get rid of it. I had a guy offer me two stud horses and two mares this week. I said, no. There comes a time you just got to say no. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Took my fences down so nobody, uh-uh, ain't got no room for no horses, no more. Thank you. So it's a matter of honor. Everybody say honor. honor. Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now stop there. This is Proverbs chapter 3. Do you remember what's the most important verses out of Proverbs chapter 3? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Heart. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. And then he goes on to say, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the, what I've blessed you with, what I gave you. So when I look at this, 1 Samuel 2.30 says, those who honor God, God will honor. So is our church going to last? I think so. See, in my heart, I'm going to tell you, you're one of the greatest outfits I've ever been around. I told my pastor this morning, I can't wait to get into church because I love, I love this house. Amen. You know, I just love this place. We've stayed up. We've prayed up. We've paid up. Amen. We did what mattered. And everyone, everyone does not possess the desire to give. I know that. Some folk, their faces are always going to have that sire look because they never release anything from their life. But I'm sad to say even some in the kingdom just pretend to have it. Their outward noises never translate into any kind of personal sacrifice. I worked hard for my money, you know, and I'm not going to let it go. Someone might say or, or think, but we can only build up treasure in heaven by giving up treasure on earth. The only way I can get cha-ching in heaven is release cha-ching on earth. Amen. Whether my time, my talent, my, 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 my tithe, my treasure, to let it go. You know, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. The Scripture says where your treasure is, there your heart is. So if you show me your treasure, some of you have put your treasure in this house. You love this house, and that's where your heart is. Some people put a treasure in an RV. They'll put it in, in a motorcycle or a vehicle. Nothing wrong with owning all that stuff. That stuff's just a, a great getaway. It's a great diversion. I love deer hunting. You know that. I love my guns. I've given away more guns than I own, and I still got a lot. 
You know, most of the guns I've given away were guns that were given to me. You know, crazy. Through inheritance or other places like that, the Lord, Lord keeps blessing, and as He gets it, I, I end up releasing, it. and it makes me smile. Amen. It blesses me. See, I have been overwhelmed at the heart of this congregation. We officially we paid off both of our churches. You know, and our people are continuing to give to our mission, our vision. We got a youth conference coming up. Uh, we got uh, a young lady we've sent out of this church, amen, Jill, who's heading over to another country. You know, you've blessed her. We're going to bless uh, about 14, 15 guys and women to go to Guatemala here pretty soon. This has been a giving church, a generous church. So it's important. God's intention is for us, amen, to understand this. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and future. Everybody say prosper. God wants you to prosper. He don't want you meandering, staying back. Listen, again, I, I've, been, I've been in places where you think, I've been up, I've been down, but I've never quit giving. I've never found myself stop giving. I just won't do it. So when I pray, I pray. When I fast, I fast. When I give, I give. Amen. I do what the Scripture tells me to do. I understand it. God's economy is always growing. Have you ever said to somebody, have a good day? Hey, have you ever said, have a good day? Yeah. Have a good day. When you say, have a good day, it literally means you have just given away some of your own happiness, which cannot be reacquired. I can't get it back. When I say, you have a good day, I'm giving away something here. here here's the thing. We have that concept with money. It's a zero-sum affair. We think in our mind that there's only so much money in the world. And if we give some away, we'll have less. Thinking God's riches are limited is as unfounded as thinking well wishes are limited. How many know I can keep saying to everybody I meet, have a good day? I can bless everybody over and over. Or, or smiles are limited. I only have four smiles today, and I've already given away four, and you ain't getting one. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing what I'm saying? We, we just think that. It's crazy to think that way. We, we think love is, is limited. I've, I've loved one woman. I'll never be able to love another. That's foolishness. That's crazy thinking. God is unlimited with resources and ways to bless you and get things to you. God gives more to those who give the most. I mean, there's just something about it. In fact, let me just say this. It's the other way around. The more you wish others well, the better you feel. The more you smile, the more smiles you create. The more love you give, the more you feel loved. And so it is with God's wealth. The more you give away, the more you create. God's economy goes way beyond math and reason. His economy is always growing. Amen. So let's talk about the principles that are woven through the Scripture. They're, they're all through the Scripture. You'll have to stay up with me, Cheryl, because I'm walking away here. Uh, Malachi, amen. Malachi says, test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. I will not open up for the, you the windows of heaven and pour out, amen, a blessing upon you. Amen. So I'm, I'm looking at Scripture, and I'm asking the Lord this week, Lord, what is it that you want me to do to help folk understand this? And he said, well, you, it, and I was talking with another pastor this week, amen, and he says to me, he says, uh, you know how I know how wonderful life is? It, it, it's, that, it's simply this, that when I give, I get a buzz. And I thought, that used to be me when I drank. Can I'd get a bus. So, I so, so what I decided to do, you can put that in your pocket and take her <laughs> out to eat. So what I decided to do is, it's like I felt like the Lord said to me, uh, give away your paycheck. Now, I, I can't give it all away. I can't give it all away because I, I still save my tithe. And I still have other things that I'm doing. I know what's in your pocket there. <laughs> Amen. This is so you'll, there you go. Now you smile. Take your daughter out to eat. <laughs> Amen. So, so what I found to do is, is you cannot give without grinning. It, does, it doesn't work. You, you've got to get past that down. That ain't yours. <laughs> Amen. You, you can't give to people. And the other people say, well, you, you can't give to people that are wealthy. Why can't I? Because if I do, it always comes back to me. Whatever you sow into, it sows back. So Malachi says, oh, I'll open the windows to you and I'll pour out blessing. Go to the next one there, sure. Amen. There is one who scatters and yet increases. There's one who scatters and yet increases. And there is one who, who withholds, without, withholds what is duly just, and yet it results only in want. You got it. Thank you. What's the next one? 
The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. So if, I, if, I, if I'm given, if I'm given, then it always comes back to me. Next scripture. Given it shall be. Pressed down. But into your lap. Uh, they will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Look, look at the title. Spoon or shovel. You can give with a spoon and you get back a spoon. You give with a shovel, you get back with a shovel. You get to choose how the blessings come back. I'm not here going to tell you that it's mandatory for you to tithe in this church. But I will tell you, as far as I'm concerned, tithing is the training wheels. It's the beginning place. Now, God didn't command that I give 30% as he did the Jewish nation. I'm not here supporting the nation. I'm here supporting the American nation. The U.S. of A. I already, you know, already know. You, most of you understand it's 30, 33 percent when you give. Amen. They're going to take it out. So then when you say, I got to go to church, I got to give a mandatory 10 percent, that's 40 something percent. God, I, I ain't got nothing left over. But I can tell you this I have blessed this nation with my giving, but I don't get a whole lot back for it other than potholes. But everything I have blessed God with and the house of God with, God makes sure that it comes back to me. And over and over, by the way, that wasn't but half my paycheck. We got another church I got to deal with. <laughs> All right. So if I run out of money, don't get mad. Just, but I understand. And I don't, you know, you do what you want to with it. But I'm just telling you this, that it's important. When, when you give, you can't give with frown. I, I, have, I laid out stuff for my children, and they already know it. But on the flip side of life, and I've been a blessing to my kids. But on the flip side of life. I, I, is there another scripture? Are we done? Is that it? So we're going to close with another one. Chronicles. Let's go back to Jabez. And we'll close with this one. Because I love this. I love this scripture, man. I, I just, I love, I love the boldness in which he did it. See, it's the way God made things to be. Generous people are blessed. They give more. They receive more. They have more. People like them. Did you know folk like generous people more than snobs? <laughs> Do you know that Scrooge never had friends until he got his heart right? Amen. There's something about it. So God cares for you, and he wants to bless you, but he's also shrewd. This is what I understand about God. God's wisdom is amazing. He knows to give resources to those who are using what they have well. A good employer will do the same thing. I entitled this message, Feed the Hot Hand. And I, I know some people say, what, what did that mean? I'm going to tell you what it means. Whenever you are in basketball, see, I used to coach basketball. And if one of my players started hitting, feed him. Feed him the ball. I, I coached girls basketball, too. That was hilarious. Uh, but if she's hitting, feed her. If, if, if this guy is catching the ball, Throw that ball to him. Feed the hot hand. And there are times that you start giving that God looks at you and says, you know what? That brother, that sister got a hot hand. And the more you give out, the more God gives. And he starts feeding the hot hand. He starts, as an employer, when I see uh, uh, certain uh, employees doing great things, it's easy for me to feed them. Amen. To bless them, to do things. Well, well even the volunteers, when I see folk volunteers, I, I, got, I want to be able to bless them. I want to do something for you. you. feed that hot hand, amen, because somebody's going to succeed there. God will give to those who will use his money as he intends. When we respond in faith to God's call, he always provides the resources. He blesses us so that we can bless others. We are blessed in order to be a blessing. God has blessed you in order to be. I can look down the history of this church and tell you who blessed this house and how God blessed them and have conversations with them. It's an amazing thought. So 1 Chronicles 4, 9, I, I don't think it's on there, sister. You may want to find it again, but you remember it from last week. It's the prayer of Jabez. The scripture says that Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. That boy was a pain. That boy had issues. That guy gave me troubles. Verse 10 says, Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. 
Oh, that you would bless me. Remember last week we put an exclamation after O? Would you say it with me? Oh, that you would bless me. And enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me. Keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. And God granted him his request. I have never heard anyone say, God is blessing me too much. I just, I got too much. It just keeps coming. I got to, I don't know what to do with it. You know what I found here in Texas? When somebody hits oil, they're going to dig another well. And they're going to get another well. And they just keep going after it. Because blessing, you just love blessings. I love blessings. I love when God blesses. Heads down, eyes closed. You got a lot to ponder, church. It's a hard issue. God loves a cheerful giver. Not somebody that's been coerced, has to. I would say even there are times you have blessed family and it was easy to do it when it was out of your heart and you were cheerful. But if you ever felt like you were coerced into doing it, it was no fun. It's just mandatory. God, our giving is a part of our worship. I want you to forgive us when we stood at times and said, no, nah, I, I can't release that when you were waiting to bless us when we did. I ask you to bless this house. Prosper this church as you've prospered all through my life. I've seen you do it. God, turn us loose. Help us to turn things loose. There are things I can't take to heaven. Tell me who to release them to. God, help me to understand what a blessing it's been to be your child. You've forgiven my past. You've released me from my guilt. You've given me a future, plans, prosperity. Yeah, there's been pain. There'll be pain again. But I'm going to ask you to take it away. And I believe boldly, God, you'll do it. You'll hear my request. Enlarge our border. Give us the ability to forgive, to release, to let go, to learn, to gain more wisdom. I love you people. I hate seeing them when they're not blessed. I hate seeing them, God, when they when they self-destructed because they won't listen to you. Help us to be people with generous hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.